We are not going to repeat this one. It's, it, it was about beer and, uh, and uh, participant. So uh, um, hello, everyone, the online and offline as well. Uh, I'm going to start with saying so, some really few words about Data Science Society. And uh, for this reason, I have my teleoperators over there. Uh, by the way, happy Halloween, everyone. I can see some of the, some of the people in the room <laughs> are prepared. Uh, and uh, so, Data Science Society, what are we? Have a seat, please. Have a seat. Uh, we should have still some time, some, some space here. So, Data Science Society, what are we? We are basically an organization that I may say recently made, made it to, through its fourth. Okay. <laughs> All right. We have to wait for this one. I'm going to start with saying <laughs> yes. some, some really few words about Africa. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it happens, you know, life, life thing. So, uh, we just made our fourth year of existence, Data Science Society as an organization, I mean. We've been going through a lot of changes, but I would say that for the last year and a half, we more or less uh, figured out what we're doing. Before that, we did a lot of meetups, uh, a lot of um, workshops, uh, some some other projects that we worked on, research projects, and we recently sat together with uh, you know the team, with the volunteers, and uh, defined our let's say pillars. First of all, we are community driven, and. Uh, the people in some of the people in the room are helping us a lot in this uh, sense. We are about transferring knowledge, so it's no, it's research and learning at the same time, and we are trying to be as fun as possible. Hence the beer, and hence the hence the funny uh, fun sessions throughout our data tones and so on. So the really the the the, the the things that we are doing, really, apart from the meetups, we have monthly meetups. Apart from this, we have uh, four times a year we have datatons. Dataton is really the most entertaining thing that, thing that we can do. It, it is a hackathon with, uh, for data scientists. It's a compressed event with uh, for within two days so a weekend. Uh, participants have to solve uh, challenge, uh, challenges that are. Uh, you know, you know, really hard challenges. The other thing that we are aiming and uh, supporting is um, community uh, community communications. Oh, it's a tough tool. Okay, it doesn't matter. So this is why we have our data chat. It is the most uh, uh, what is important uh, communicational channel for us. Uh, if you have seen this event in Facebook, for example, uh, congratulations, you're a lucky one. But uh, we don't count uh, Facebook as this, this important as our data ch uh, data chat. And if you're interested in all sorts of data talk, uh, challenges, problems, data humor, you name it. Uh, Please join us and, uh, on our website, which is datasciencesociety.net, and join the data chat. Uh, and the beer here, as well as everything that we have, cannot be possible without, I'm going to skip through the portals, I'm going to, 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 to stop here, is, cannot be possible without our sponsors. Uh, our society sponsors are Receipt Bank, it's a startup, uh, fintech startup that works on really smart technologies on uh, uh, automatization of accounting. A Data Pro is a company that uh, works with uh, data, with, uh, especially with uh, uh, humanizing the data. WorldQuant, the name kind of says everything is, a, um, actually it's a hedge fund, but they are doing a lot of data approaches towards uh, investment. And Telelink, of course, is uh, this huge Bulgarian company that is doing all sorts of um, IoT projects, all, sort of, all sorts of um, um, management uh, strategy, strategy ma management projects and so on. So these are our sponsors. Thanks for them. We have beer and we have this uh, wonderful environment here. And I would like to you to warmly applaud them. Yeah. And 
And now that we have uh, figured this out, uh, I'm going to go with the current event. First of all, before I forget, before you leave here, the room, we are going to have a special surprise at the end. We have a um, lottery for everyone who has registered for this event. There is a lottery, and the winner of the lottery will win uh, the, the ticket for uh, the AI Congress, the biggest AI Congress uh, in the world, uh, uh, organized by We Are Developers. We Are Developers are our partners. And um, the Congress is in Vienna, uh, 4th and 5th of December. And it, is, um, it seems like a very hype place to be. Uh, I know some of the lecturers. I know a lot of the uh, guys who are going. So it seems like a, a good idea to go. And uh, we are going to make a lottery at the end for all those who have registered for this event officially. We are going to have a lottery to uh, get a winner and some uh, additional discount that they have given us, community discount for Data Science Society. So if you want to stay tuned and wait till the end. Now, for this event, also, we have uh, partners, the partners here from Nauka Bege, and we are very thankful for them. This is an organization that promotes science in, in general, and uh, uh, in, very, in many cases, they are, uh, our missions are the same. So, uh, yes, they are focused on Bulgarian uh, scientific uh, um, community and, uh, and Bulgarian community. So everything is in Bulgarian, but uh, please make sure to check them out. They are, they are very helpful and uh, we are good friends. Now, uh, I'm going to say a few words about the speakers. Although some of the, some of the information has al already been published in the event and so on, uh, today we have Today's event, as you already know, is uh, astrophysics, so data science and ast means astrophysics, basically. And we have two great uh, lecturers today. The first lecturer, Nikolai Kacharov, he is actually going to lecture us all the way from the other side of the world uh, via teleconferencing. Uh, you probably uh, missed. Uh, you probably seen his face at the beginning of our mishaps with the, with the technics here. Uh, so he's already waiting online for us. And so what is he? He has studied uh, uh, physics and astronomy in Sofia University uh, as a bachelor and as a, and as a master's as well. And then he moved to Heidelberg to, to work on his PhD. Uh, he graduated several, year, uh, several years ago. Then he made a postdoc and you kind of get it that he is a smart guy because he has made a Max Planck uh, postdoc, uh, Max Planck Institute postdoc, and uh, he is uh, focused on, uh, he studies the building of galaxies. And you can imagine, literally, we are speaking about astronomical sizes of the data there. So, very interesting uh, thing. Now, now, uh, our next lecturer will be Jordan Darakchiev. He's over here. He's going to be live for, the, for this audience and for everybody else. He's, he's going to be a picture on the, on the screen. Uh, he's, uh, th there is an interesting story at the end because, uh, that connects both of them. Uh, but he has, uh, he, he has done a lot of things with us already. First of all, he's an astrophysicist uh, studying, doing his PhD in Sofia University currently. And his uh, topic is, uh, uh, he tried to explain it, but I will uh, generalize it as astrobiology. Let's, let's, let's stop it there. And uh, by the way, as, as far as I, rem I remember, you're going to be near there in your lecture today. So uh, astrobiology, but also he has done a lot of data science stuff. Uh, he, for example, he has uh, graduated at the Lyric Academy, and he is now a lecturer at the Software University, and he also led the team of data scientists solving the, uh, solving the uh, Academia Dataton Challenge in April when we have this uh, event. And he is, uh, I mean, there is a long list here of his activities, teaching astrobiology, Image processing, obviously connected with, uh, with uh, astrophysics, web development, and probably everything else. And um, so, yeah, this is, this is our speakers. 
And finally, I would like, before I give the word to Nikuai, uh, I would like to give you a, a, a tip. We have a platform for asking questions, which is a famous platform, Slido. So, sli.do, S-L-I.do. And uh, before you, uh, the, the, the code that you have to enter is DSS, like Data Science Society. So, please just join, type, type your questions, and at the end, we are going to uh, answer, okay, we are going to make the, the, the lectures, lecturers answer them. Uh, we already have some questions, which is fine. Keep up the good work. Uh, and I think at this moment, it's time for all of us to listen to Nikuai. Uh, is he online already? Okay, Nikuai, can you hear me? Just a second.
curve. This is what people expected to see when they first start, started to study these things. Uh, the galaxy rotates and the rotation speeds of the stars varies with radius. As you go further out, the rotation speed increases until some point until you reach the edge of the galaxy where you don't add any more additional mass. And the outermost stars should start to rotate more and more slowly just because they have felt already the, the entire mass of the galaxy and there is nothing much to add. But the surprise was that all observed curves of galaxies looked like the green curve here. This drop in the rotation was never seen. This means that there must be much more mass, much more invisible mass in every galaxy that we don't know what it is and we call it dark matter. This discovery was made in the late 70s, already maybe for more than 40 years ago by Vera Rubin, uh, which showed that 85%, typically 85% of the mass of the galaxy is dark. And this result has been confirmed and reconfirmed multiple times in the last few decades. It is still one of the most, uh, one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of our understanding of the universe. What makes dark matter? Additionally, by studying the stellar motions, we could also have an insight of how the galaxies were built and how they evolved. And for example, on this picture here, uh, this is a real HST Hubble Space Telescope image of the galaxy NGC 5907, which you see it as an edge-on disk here. But because the image is so deep, you basically see streams of other stars that are infalling in, onto the galaxy. These are, this basically shows us that galaxies go to mergers. And on the next slide, I basically show the merger tree of one particular giant galaxy. In the past, at the, when galaxies were formed in the early universe, they were much smaller and lighter systems. But they merged together to form larger systems similar to the Milky Way and similar to many other giant galaxies that we see in the local universe today. The Milky Way is definitely not one of the largest. And to illustrate that hierarchical growth of galaxies, I'm going to show you a discovery that our group made a couple of years ago. This was actually before I joined the group, so I'm not going to take any credit of it. But here we, they discovered the densest galaxy in the universe. And on this slide, uh, this is an image of the so the, uh, of a giant elliptical galaxy called M60 in the center of the image. And then on the upper right side, there is another galaxy. I forgot its name, uh, but it is just in the foreground. But also on this image is the densest galaxy in the universe. Normally I would ask people to try to show it to me and see what, what the public thinks, of things, but now I cannot see your reaction, so I'm going to uh, right away show it to you. The densest galaxy in the universe is right here. And now I'm starting to slowly bridge towards data science and show you how we know that. So my colleagues took spectra in the field of this very tiny dot here that you see on the image and measured how quickly the stars move in this blob of light. And what they saw is that, uh, this is a map of this field, and the red color indicates a very sharp rise of the velocities of stars in the center of the galaxy. And they could only explain that if there is a giant supermassive black hole in the center of this object. So here you see their model, and on the vertical axis you have the black hole mass. On the horizontal axis you have another model parameter, which we call mass-to-light ratio, 
and it characterizes basically it characterizes how old the stars are and it reflects our ignorance of that we don't know uh, what kind of stars made this galaxy up. But regardless of what stars make this galaxy up, it must have a supermassive black hole of more than 20 million solar masses. This is a supermassive, this, ma this black hole is more massive even than what we have in the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this means that initially this very small dot of light was a system larger uh, than the Milky Way itself. And here is a movie made of a simulation of what we think happened. This galaxy was a normal giant galaxy, but it was lucky, unlucky enough to fall into the halo of M60, this giant galaxy in the middle of the picture. Here is the movie. It has started, it, fall, it fell in about 500 million years ago. And through multiple passages uh, around the center of M60, it was stripped off of almost all of its stars until only the very central and dense region remained intact with the supermassive black hole in its center. All other stars of this galaxy are now lost in the halo of M60 that you see. But now I'm going to talk about my own work. And I want to tell you about a galaxy that I recently investigated. It is called the Phoenix Dwarf. And you see it on a picture here on the left. It is a fairly isolated small galaxy that is currently falling towards the Milky Way. It is close enough that with the telescope that you see on the right, we could actually see individual stars. And what we did is we took spectra of several hundred individual stars in this galaxy and measured their radio velocities. So this is uh, the data that we have. Basically, how we measure uh, the velocities of the stars, we take a spectrum, and then we see if the spectrum is slightly redshifted, which would mean that the star is moving away from us, or slightly blue shifted, which would mean that the, the star is moving uh, towards us. This is because of the, of the Doppler effect. On the diagram on the right, you see that the ellipse shows the boundaries, so like the, the radius of, the, of this dwarf galaxy. And all the points are the positions of the stars that we measured, color coded by their velocity. At first, uh, you would see that most of the stars have this blue shade, so a velocity of around minus 20, 30 kilometers per second, which means that the galaxy is coming towards us. You also see that there are several stars that have abnormally high uh, velocities. These are stars that probably belong to the foreground, that belong to our own Milky Way. So whatever model we built to understand this, uh, the kinematics of this galaxy, we also have to include the possibility of uh, outliers or contamination from our own galaxy. And now I will show you how we can build a kinematic model for this galaxy, what we can learn from it, and uh, basically how, how we do uh, the entire work. So let's build a kinematic model for Phoenix. The easiest model that we could think of is that the galaxy, the motions of the stars in this galaxy could be represented by two components, random motions, which we also call velocity dispersion, and ordered motions, which we call rotation, and I talked about it a little bit already. But let's start with modeling the random motions first. We will use a very simple Gaussian function which would be centered 
at the mean velocity of the galaxy and to have a velocity dispersion. Oh, this, these are basically the relative motions of the stars with respect to each other within the galaxy itself. The velocity dispersion will also be allowed to vary with radius and we'll have a functional form uh, like this. Here you have the velocity dispersion on the vertical axis as a function of the radial distance uh, from the galactic center. Uh, the stars have highest relative motions near the center and then it recedes uh, going outwards. This function will be characterized by two parameters too. We will have central velocity dispersion and the scale radius. And the scale radius is actually sensitive to, actu to how much dark matter there is in the galaxy. The central dispersion is sensitive to what is the total mass of the galaxy. Or the scale radius grows higher and this curve becomes flatter if there is a lot of dark matter. Or the curves or the scale radius becomes smaller and the curve and the dispersion falls quicklier if there is less dark matter. And now, uh, so our model so far has three, three parameters. This is the mean velocity, the center of velocity dispersion, and the scale radius. Now, the second part of the model is the, uh, the rotation. So I'm going to use a rotation curve very similar to what I showed before. At first, the rotation rises. And then at some point, we expect the rotation to fall down uh, when uh, we, we have essentially reached the edge of the galaxy. We will characterize this curve again by three parameters. One of the parameters is, of course, the rotation axis. And then we have the rotation amplitude, which is again connected to the mass of the galaxy, and a scale radius of rotation, which is basically the radius at which the rotation will start to decrease, which is, again, sensitive to the mass distribution in the galaxy or the dark matter. This model, again, has three, three parameters. Rotation axis, rotation amplitude, and again, scale radius. And as I told you, we need to include contaminants. So I'm allowing for my model to have an additional component in the velocity dispersion, another Gaussian function, which will be centered at the mean velocity of the Milky Way stars in the direction of our object of interest, the Phoenix Dwarf Galaxy. And it will have the velocity dispersion of the Milky Way stars in that direction of the sky. So we have built a model that has seven free parameters. And now we have to choose a method to fit this model to the data. And now what follows is a very short introduction to Bayesian inference. I cannot do that without uh, putting the bias theorem here, which basically tells you that the probability of your chosen model being correct in light of your data is equal to the probability of your data being drawn from that model multiplied by the probability of your model being correct. I have to say these, all these things have names and I will list them here. Uh, the likelihood is the probability that your data is drawn from the model that we have constructed. And then the prior is the probability of the model itself being correct. So what goes into our priors here are the shape of our models, the, sh the shape of the dispersion profile, that it has to be high in the, mid, in, the, in the center and then drops going outwards. The same with the rotation, that it has to rise in the center regions and then drop in the, uh, in the outer regions and so on. And then this is all normalized by the so-called evidence, which is the probability of our data being measured correctly at all. So the probability, uh, the, the, the evidence is a 
uh, normalization constant actually, which we could derive from the other parameters. We could basically just have to marginalize the likelihood and the prior over all model parameters. And it is called the evidence because it is important to judge how good our chosen model is. And for example, if someone else comes to me and says, okay, I have a better model to describe the motions in your galaxy. What we can do is we could try to get the posterior in light of my model and other person's model, and then we will compare uh, this integral, the evidence, and whoever has the larger evidence, well, their model is basically better suitable to, uh, to describe the system. In principle, in most cases, it is impossible to actually derive the posterior distribution or the model, the, the model parameter posteriors per se, uh, analytically. And we, the best we could most often do is basically draw from the posterior. And this is done uh, by methods which are uh, by MCMC methods or Markov chain Monte Carlo. What we basically do is we, we start with a random guess of what our model parameters should be. Then we estimate the posterior at that point in the parameter space. Then we make a random jump uh, from this guess parameter and we check if we have arrived in a position in the parameter space which has higher probability or lower probability. If the probability is lower, we reject that, we reject that, uh, that jump and go back to the initial value and make another random jump. If we have, however, arrived at the position in the parameter space that has higher probability, we have to make a choice whether to accept it or reject this step with a certain probability. And this is chosen so that when the, well, we call these jumps a walker. So when the walker reaches high probability values, it will start to explore and sample uh, the entire probability space. And what we will have in the end is a distribution, a drawing, uh, a draw from the, from from the posterior distribution, essentially. And this is what we want to have an understanding of our model. So usually you have a burn-in time in the Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, usually one excludes the first 50% of the, or first 80% of the, of the chain, and then focuses only on the last steps where, uh, the, where essentially the chain samples from the probability distribution. So this is the most basic MCMC method. It's called the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. It, it is incredibly slow. Uh, mathematically, actually, it can show that it actually converges after infinite number of steps. Uh, but there are other algorithms that have much uh, quicker convergence. And for example, I'm using uh, something which is called the stretch move MCMC. And the difference with the classical Metropolis Hastings algorithm is that we don't have a single walker, but we kind of unleash an army of walkers that simultaneously explore the parameter space and talk to each other to adjust their jumps and their steps so that they very quickly converge and start to sample from the actual uh, posterior distribution. So here is an example. I think it's a very busy plot, but a uh, very busy slide, but I just want to see it from above. And this is, th these are all our seven free parameters plotted against each other. So in the histograms on top, you see how they have, uh, where basically you see the mean and, the, and, the, and they are spread. So this, is, this shows the best fit parameters and how uncertain 
they are given the data. And all the other plots show the covariances, whether they are parameters that depend very strongly on each other. And this is everything we need to see for this model to know if it's a good or not. And I can demonstrate you now in light with the data how good this interpretation of the galaxy motion is as a basically two component model of random motions and rotation. Maybe you would notice here that from all the parameters, actually only the dispersion scale radius is not well constrained. And there is a reason for that. And I left it on purpose like that uh, to demonstrate that as well. So here. But first, here I'm plotting again all the measured velocities for our galaxy. And I've color coded them with a probability of belonging to the galaxy or not. So the blue shaded uh, points uh, actually have much higher probability to belong to the, our own Milky Way than to the Phoenix Dwarf. And you, actually, you can already see here that the model has a very good job to exclude uh, contaminants. The red shaded points are all the stars that belong that have high probability to belong to the galaxy. And I have plotted over them uh, the best fit rotation curve plus minus uh, the velocity dispersion. So you actually, you would expect all the stars that belong to Phoenix to fall between these two, uh, between these two shaded uh, dashed curves. And now let's again compare the model to the data and see what to infer from the rotation axis. On the left side, you see the raw data as I uh, presented it a couple of slides ago. And on the right plot, I have excluded all the contaminants and plot only stars that have higher probability to belong to Phoenix. And I also overplot the rotation axis. And I do that by drawing 100 random draws from the, from the posterior distribution for this parameter. So you could also have a feeling about the uncertainty of how well the rotation axis has been determined. But you could already see in this picture that by, exclu by only excluding the contaminants, we, ha we have much clearer view of what's going on. We see that the galaxy is rotating and on one side, most of the stars are shaded red, which means that they're receding from us. And on the right side, most of the stars are shaded blue, which means that they are coming faster towards us. And this rotation pattern is the most puzzling thing about these galaxies. I was shocked when I saw this for the first time, and so were all my collaborators, because it seems to be rotating around its major axis. This is very unusual. Usually when a system rotates, it becomes flattened. Also, for example, the Earth is flattened uh, from the poles because it's rota it, it rotates like that. We would expect the rotation axis to be perpendicular and then we'd say, okay, that's a normal galaxy. It is flattened by rotation. But this, this, this thing essentially rotates like a rugby ball and that was puzzling us for quite a bit. Now, I think we have a hypothesis why it is like that, and I will share this with you in a moment. Uh, but before that, I would also show the other uh, model parameters. So here I show the rotation curve, the, the rotation curve of the galaxy, and I have binned my data, and I have measured essentially the mean velocity on this axis perpendicular to the rotation axis. I have measured the mean uh, velocity of the galaxy, and that's how I have arrived with this blue point here. And then again, I have drawn a 100 random uh, draws from the, from the posterior about the rotation model, and you see how it basically describes the data. On the right hand side, I do the same thing with the velocity dispersion profile. But you actually see already that the velocity dispersion profile of this galaxy looks very flat. 
And that is why the scale radius was not determined very well, uh, because all the models that sh show the velocity dispersion of these galaxies are essentially flat, and there is there is no scale radius to uh, to come up with. But this actually already tells us that this galaxy is very dark matter dominated. We really don't see the drop uh, in dispersion that we would expect when we actually get don't have any more stars to uh, to observe. And also with the rotational pattern, we actually don't see the drop in rotation as well. It means that there is much more mass in this galaxy than we actually see in stars. But that's, that's actually not a so surprising result that we would know. We already know for 40 years that this is the case in most galaxies. So this was a demonstration about the kinematic model. And the next step would be to make a full dynamical model. Now we know how the stars move in this galaxy, but we have to explain why they move like that. And to this aim, we use something which is called the Jeans equation. These are equations that describe uh, dynamically with using the gravitational force, uh, the motion of a system and they could be derived from thermodynamical uh, constraints and also from the Newtonian law of gravity. I'm not going to explain how this equation and why this equa equation works exactly. I just want to point a few things here. The method uh, that we do the Bayesian inference to get the, model the dynamical model parameters is essentially the same as the kinematic models. We just have much more complex uh, function here. Uh, so the kinematic tracer density enters in these models. These are the basically the observed velocities and the distribution of stars in the galaxy. We have the gravitational potential, which is a free function uh, to fit into the model. Basic, and this is probably the most important parameter because it describes physically why the system is like that. We have this model parameter here, which is called an isotropy, and it is related to the fact that the galaxy is, of course, a 3D object, and we only see it uh, as a 2D uh, on the sky. And we have to make some uh, assumptions about its, uh, about its, its 3D shape. And what we get in the end from this model is the predicted velocities at any given position in the galaxy. So this model already becomes uh, pretty complex with uh, not only parameters uh, to adjust, but entire functions. So we use a hierarchical Bayesian model in that case, where uh, fitting part of, the, uh, part of the parameter space becomes a prior for another part of the parameter space and so on. But this is still a work in progress and I'm Unfortunately, I cannot show you results at the moment uh, because uh, we, well, we are actually still working on, on this model. There are some problems that we uh, still have to figure out, which are mostly related to the, again, to the very unusual rotation of this system. Because the genes equations, per se, they cannot find a physical solution that actually gives you that uh, rotational pattern but we think we know how to solve this. It will just require some more work. And with that, I want to, I will come to my conclusion slide. And actually I want to show you what our hypothesis is about what happens to this galaxy and why it has this unusual motion pattern. And this hypothesis will either be confirmed or rejected when we actually have our full dynamical model. So, on the left-hand side, you see again uh, a picture of the Phoenix Dwarf Galaxy. And then we have one more data space that I didn't talk about before. And it is the color of the stars. Because we know that redder stars are usually old stars. And bluer stars are young stars. And what we observed in our first campaign to study this galaxy was the old stars, all the reddish dots that are encompassed in this circle here. 
But if you look closely in the figure, in the very center, you will see a very flattened structure of blue stars. It is essentially here. And what we think is that this galaxy merged with another dwarf galaxy several hundred million years ago when these young stars were born. And since they're so flattened, we think that they must rotate very rapidly. We don't know that yet because we don't have velocity data for these stars. Uh, and this is one of the next things to do uh, to measure the velocities of these stars. If, you are, if I'm right, they will be very rapidly rotating. And they rotate in the same direction as we have found the halo rotates. So somehow, due to this dwarf-dwarf merger of two galaxies, new stars were formed in a very flattened disk that swirled the entire merger remnant after that in this unusual way. And with this, I want to conclude. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nikolai. Actually, we have several uh, interesting questions. <laughs> uh, we have several questions. I'm actually telling you this because he's hearing it uh, several seconds. We are going to switch to the Slido screen. There are several questions. We have also questions from the YouTube channel. And I'm going to uh, head over there and speak directly uh, to cut on the on this exactly. So uh, we are asking some questions. Hello, Nikwai. Can you hear me? Uh, I cannot hear you. Hi, I I hear you well. Okay. Yeah, but I hope did you did you hear the presentation well? Excellent, excellent. Everything was excellent. Good, thank you. <laughs> because I didn't have any feedback and I was talking here and wasn't completely sure if everything is go is okay, but I assume so. Okay, we have several questions. Excellent, yes, I'm happy to hear. Uh, maybe some of the questions are more of a general general yeah. uh, field, but anyway, we'll start. Uh, yeah. Is it true that the other name of the Milky Way is the Chaos Galaxy? So, sorry, how? Is it... Uh, true that the other name of Milky Way is the Chaos Galaxy. Um, to be honest, I have never heard about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we usually yeah. The, the our galaxy is called the Milky Way, and we often refer to it as the Galaxy with capital G. So this means this means that we are a bit egocentric, I guess. That is correct. Yes. So okay. in the literature, if people see galaxy written with the capital G, it usually refers to the Milky Way. <laughs> but I have never heard about K K Chaos Galaxy. Is it? I... Yes, it's uh, it's a name of a guy who uh, which name sounds like uh, animal. Hmm. Cow. Okay. The cow? No, I, I've never heard about that. Honestly. <laughs> okay. Next, more general question. Can we predict the place of our solar system after the merger of the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy? Uh, that's actually that's a very interesting uh, thing to do. Actually, I don't know if people have done it, uh, but with such dynamical models and also like uh, n-body simulations of galactic mergers, uh, this this could be done. Yes, I have to check in the literature if someone has already done it. Okay, so. Good question, whoever asked, uh, asked it. Next question. Which is going to dominate in the great attractor or dark energy regarding our galaxy and the local group? Oh, very good question. Uh, I didn't talk about dark energy at all. Uh, but so there are, like, there are two main mysteries in the universe so far. Uh, one is what is dark matter. And the other, which is basically the hidden mass that is in all galaxies that we see. But the dark energy is, it works as a anti-gravity. It basically causes the universe to accelerate uh, its expansion. 
Uh, okay. Probably what we would expect, so we, we know that the universe expands. And, uh, but what we thought until recently uh, was that the universe will expand slowly and slowly because the gravity of all the galaxies and all the systems that are in all the, of, because of the gravity of all the matter will try to shrink the universe back. But what was found in the early 2000s, like I think a Nobel Prize about this discovery was given in 2010 or something like that, uh, was that not only the universe doesn't slow down its expansion, it is expanding more and more rapidly. And this means that there is some energy force in the universe that drives this expansion. And we, know, we don't know what that is. But now to the question, so the great attractor is essentially a super cluster of galaxies which are close to us and our entire group our entire local group of galaxies is falling towards the super cluster of galaxies uh, but then again we i think we will definitely fall into that super cluster the dark energy works on much larger scales so basically you you cannot see the effect of dark energy in the local universe in the local universe, the, gal the galaxy's motions are ruled by the local gravitational forces. But then as you go further out and further out, uh, you will start to see that the expansion of the universe, essentially. Okay, thank you for the second lecture here. Uh, and uh, uh, another general question. Yes. So it goes like this. Games like Elite Dangerous, obviously video game, have vast procedurally generated uh, galaxies. Procedurally generated means by model, not by, by an artist. So how much do developers of such games collaborate with scientific community when designing their environments? Um, I'm not sure about that, but it is certainly possible. Uh, people do uh, galaxy mergers all the time to end body simulations and hydrodynamical simulations. So the, 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 the codes uh, for doing that exist. Uh, they're, usually, they're, they're usually very heavy codes. So I'm not sure how feasible this is to be done uh, in real time in a game. Uh, because as far as I know, like usually some end body, like complex end body simulations or hydrodynamical simulations take months to run. Okay. But if you, I'm sure if you if you if you uh, search on YouTube, for example, about uh, galaxy merger simulations, there are very beautiful uh, movies made out of real simulations. Yeah, like uh, Interstellar. Oh well, yeah, of, co of course. Like one reference in, in the Interstellar, actually, the uh, the black hole was modeled physically. Right. Okay. Next question. Would you say a little more about the modi modified MCMC method, which you're using? Um, Maybe a reference will do also if you. Yes, uh, I think the the reference I probably could write up somewhere, but this is uh, Goodman and Ware are the authors of the method. Mm -hmm. and I think it's from 2010. I have to check the year of the publication. Okay. Goodman, like. All right. Yeah, I can probably write it out. Yeah, and where uh, we, yeah, with E in the end. Uh -huh. I think that's the name of the authors. And I'm not completely sure about the year, but I think it's 2010. Okay. And uh, like just to give you, so if the people who ask the question, if they're familiar with the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, uh, this, this uh, the stretch move algorithm works in a very similar way. It works as you have running at the same time many Metropolis Hastings chains. And usually by many, like you can have from 100 to 1,000, for example. And they talk to each other to basically adjust their steps. In the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, uh, usually you have to predefine your step. And if you have a very small step, uh, yeah, you will fairly quickly reach the maximum of the posterior distribution, but it will take you a very long time to sample the entire distribution with this very small step. If you have a very large step, on the other hand, 
uh, you will jump constantly to places with low probability and you have so many rejected uh, steps that it will again take you a very long time to sample the entire probability space. So actually it's a typical trade-off that you have to yeah. make. And, and in the stretch move algorithm, each walker basically adjusts its step on the depending on where the other walkers are and how far it is from the maximum of the posterior distribution. Okay. So like at, at every step, the random, uh, the, ran the random jumps are adjusted to ensure a very quick convergence. Okay, okay, thank you. Next question, and there are more. So, um, where did it go? Yes, here it is. Are you cons uh, considering the rotation of velocity of the observed stars when you're calculating the membership probability or they're too far and that doesn't play any role? Uh, so, the, so it is an entirely consistent model, so everything is considered. Uh, yes, so, yeah. so basically the, the, the model optimizes all the seven parameters simultaneously with the rotation and the membership probability. Okay, I think there is one more. Oh no, there is more than one more. In building the movement model, how many years epoch are you relying? No idea about what kind of data are you having access to? Uh, so with, uh, about the movement, so we actually, what you observe, if I understand the question correctly, is what you observe is the radial velocity of the star and it is it is basically a current snapshot of the velocity. And I suspect what, what the person asks about is norm and this is this is only one component of the of the velocity. Uh, we don't really know how the star moves on the sky. And for that we actually to observe that, we have to wait for many years to actually see the stars moving. And we can do that in our Milky Way, in the, in our own galaxy. But we cannot do that yet in external, in other galaxies. We basically have to wait an infinite amount of time, of time to actually see the stars uh, moving on the sky. So we actually have to rely on radio velocity only. And we have to, for the dynamical models, we have to make, uh, well, we have to marginalize basically over the unknown uh, to other components of the velocity. There is no other way out of it. Okay, and last question. Oh, you finished with that, right? Yes. Okay, last question. When did you start to learn data science? Uh, that's a, I, I haven't considered myself a data scientist, but I guess that's uh, what we do as an astronomers. Uh, we basically collect data and we try to make the best out of it. Uh, so I guess that that's what I have been working to my PhD and postdoc after that. So, yeah, uh, I would say I'm doing data science since 2010, if you <laughs> consider it like that. Or I'm doing like I'm doing model inference since that time. Okay. Recently, I actually started to be more interested into machine learning algorithms per se, but this is only in less since less than a year. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your participation. This concludes the questioning session. I would like to hear the applause forever for you. Uh, Thank you very much. And uh, we were very happy to have you uh, on board and thankful, uh, thankful for your contribution. And we'll have to move to our next lecturer. Sure. But I'm interested to hear that too on YouTube. Okay. So. 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 We are moving on with our program. Somebody deal with it with this broom. <laughs> okay, so uh, as they say, AI is easy, AV is hard. So audio video is always the, the hardest thing about AI. Anyhow. Uh, now we move to our next uh, lecturer for today. Uh, you're done. Uh, you're done, Direct Chief. But there is an interesting connection that I'm going to make anyway. You, know, you knew that I'm going to do it anyway.
Uh, the connection is that these guys actually have studied in the same school, almost at the same time. And actually, Nikolai was one of the prime reasons for Jordan to start going into physics, into astrophysics. So here we are, now he's doing his PhD there. He's the, you know, build-up researcher in astrophysics. Uh, but one of the reasons why he has done this is because of Nikolai. Is that correct? Okay, so now uh, with this, I'm going to give the floor to Jordan, and uh, uh, he's, he has an excellent, uh, interesting presentation as well. So. Hey, everyone. Actually, actually, there is one more thing. I've seen Nikki about uh, three or four times in my life in person. And one of these times was when I started studying here. I just came. Well, there's an interesting story about how I, how I started learning astrophysics at university, but that's another topic. Just the same day when I applied at university, I saw him. And I told him that uh, he's one of the prime reasons that uh, I loved astrophysics. And uh, I, was going to, I was going to start to start learning astrophysics. Well, right now, six years later, I haven't seen him again. <laughs> I I'm sure that's uh, I'm sure that's not a bad thing, but still, I haven't seen him again. But I followed his research, and so well, you know, karma is a funny thing. So just wanted to share that there is a very interesting connection, and you see, we are at very different uh, at very different times in our lives. He's a bit older than me. Uh, he's a bit uh, he has a bit more advanced, a little bit different research than me. Um, there are not many things that connect us, but he started learning about machine learning uh, like some months ago, and I was like an expert in that, which felt really good. Okay, so you know, based on inference, the thing that Nikki told you about is a very cool thing. Physicists like Bayesian formulas, and one of the biggest reasons that physicists like Bayesian analytics, Bayesian formulas and things like that, is that they're interpretable. Well, okay, but there's another approach. Uh, you see, I think it's going to be 2020, um, a very big telescope is going to, well, is everything okay here? Yeah, yeah okay, a very big telescope is, start, is going to start operating. This telescope, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, is going to generate 30 terabytes of data per night, which is about between 8 and 12 hours. Well, we usually see things like big data is coming to our field. Machine learning, artificial intelligence has to be implementing. It's, a, it's an emerging technology, it's coming. But well, let me tell you, it's come 20 years ago. It's not coming right now. And we are behind. We are behind as researchers, as, uh, you know, as scientists. And I'm going to present a little bit different approach. You see, the modern approach to solve problems is a little bit different. I have not, uh, I have not put a single formula in my slides. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you saw, you saw the intro of Simon Nikis, right? Uh, so we have a different approach. Step one, take a problem. Prefer a big one you don't understand. Step, step two, throw a neural network at it. Step three, profit. So that's what I'm trying to talk about. So there's, there's this cool thing called machine learning. And I'm going to present an application of that. I'm going to present you a very simple physical model and a very simple statistical model and how these two can be combined. And actually, I have two reasons for that. One of them, the paper I'm going to talk about is, um, was published like a month ago, so it's a very modern research. Second of all, um, you know, I'm a little bit uh, in astrobiology, and part of, uh, part of astrobiology is searching for exoplanets, planets outside our solar system. You know, the prime candidates for finding aliens. Um, by the way, yeah, astrobiology is a very fun thing. You see, I, I suppose you know statistics, and how do you, how you do biology with sample size one? 
how to do statistics with sample size one? Well, it's very different. Uh, it's very different than ordinal statistics. Anyway, that's not a topic. But exoplanets, you know, the prime candidates for finding alien life, is uh, a very hot and a very important topic. So I'm going to present you a simple model of how to do that. By the way, that model was created by Google Brain, and I have been involved just a little bit with it, and I've worked with it. So that's what uh, I'm trying to do. Let's start with uh, the most uh, the most important things in astronomy. You see, um, different to other sciences, in astronomy we cannot experiment. We cannot go to the sun, even if it's uh, light, uh, like some eight light minutes away. We cannot go and just take a ladle out of the sun and study that plasma. We just can't. We we'll burn ourselves. It's like uh, 6,000 degrees Celsius. We can't go anywhere. We can only watch. So it's like we're in a prison and we have to make sense of the world around us, which is a very different, uh, a very different thing than what we do in other sciences. And there is only one thing we rely on, pictures, taking pictures. So there is only one concept in astronomy, brightness, light. So there are a lot of uh, things related to brightness, you know, you'll see brightness, flux, uh, apparent flux, things like that. I'm not going to bother you with that, but it's a very, it's a very difficult thing to do. And see, whatever we do, we rely on light, and especially since, uh, since that's what light is, we rely on images. That's why uh, every astronomer usually works with some kind of image. So here you see what, what can we do. For example, here is an image. Find the galaxies within that image. So you see there is one galaxy here, uh, a nebula, an, a pair of nebulae actually, and this is the problem here, a very specific image localization problem. You may approach that from, you know, machine learning, when you know you have an image and you have to output however many coordinates of the centers there are. So this is image localization. There's another thing, and this is classification. You already know a great deal about galaxies and dark matter and things like that. Well. Galaxies actually have a very simple classification based on their shape. Nikki told you about elliptical galaxies, there are also spiral galaxies like, like our Milky Way and uh, several more types which are a little bit more confusing to describe. But you see, can you take a picture and first find the galaxies within that picture and second try to classify what kind of galaxy there is? Well, it seems you can. Uh, this actually is an implementation using the so-called YOLO algorithm. Uh, you only look once, which is used for face detection. Yeah, and the same thing was uh, just taken and applied to galaxies. And it seems like the same algorithm that takes faces can detect galaxies, which is a pretty cool thing. All right, so I will need to bother with a little bit of physics, unfortunately. You see, uh, these are the raw data that came in. But in most cases, we are more interested in another kind of data. These are the so-called light curves. And you see, they measure light and they're curves. So that's why they're called light curves. There are objects whose apparent brightness, how, uh, how bright we receive them, changes over time. So see, for example, the moon, uh, you see, when it's uh, a full moon outside, you can even read in the moonlight. And when it's a new moon, you can't even see the road ahead of you. So this is one object that changes brightness over time. And actually, we are quite interested in this. You see, that's the only thing we know. That's the only thing we can take. But uh, there are a lot of things that can be done with just that small flack of information. So you see, these are three very different curves, and uh, there are special characteristics, and you can deduce a lot of things. I have to explain what that means. So, here you have something called phase, and uh, 
here actually is uh, the original observation date. What you do is you point a telescope to an object, you take a picture of that object, and you measure how bright it is. A lot of times. Preferably over a very long period of time. And you see variability. You see that this apparent brightness changes over time. Well, uh, in astronomy, very uh, in astronomy, many things are quite uh, unusual and quite disturbing. One of the disturbing things here is that actually the brightness is measured in the reverse. Magnitude is a measure of brightness, just that. And uh, magnitude 3 is much more brighter than magnitude 4. So don't ask me how, it's just uh, how astronomy works. Uh, so the sun when you see the sun in the sky, it has a magnitude of minus 26. The full moon has a magnitude of minus 13. Um, the, the brightest star in the sky, which is Sirius, has an apparent brightness of minus 1.5. And uh, the dimmer an object gets, the larger the value of the magnitude is. So here's what these mean. Phase is the same kind of diagram here. Just think about this as cropped out and superimposed. You take an arbitrary moment for a zero, you take the so-called period, the time of repetition, and you just slice these things and superimpose them on one another, which creates a little bit more, well, clean diagram. So this is the so-called light curve, which shows you how apparent brightness, how, an object, how bright an object appears in the sky, changes over time. And there are a lot of things here. So for example, this one is um, a system called ALGO, an eclipsing binary. Two stars which eclipse each other. One passes in front of each other. Well, it's different to, to move my hands like that. This one is a completely different kind of star. This star actually expands and contracts. The, it's the so-called delta C phase, uh, the so-called uh, the prototype of the C phase. And actually, there's one more thing. This period is very strictly precise, and this period actually allows us to measure things in space, to measure very, very far away distances. But you see, this light curve looks completely different, and. We can try to explain that, and we can try to measure physics, physical properties like radius, temperature, um, velocity, like radial velocity, expansion, contraction velocity, things like that. We can measure orbits, how far away these eclipsing binaries, as they're called, are. How big one is, you see you have a big minimum here. So a, a great uh, change in brightness. So a very large object has passed and uh, reduced the brightness. Here the object is smaller, so you can decide that, uh, you can deduce that actually when one object passes in front of, of, in front of the other, when it's the largest object, you have a greater dip. So here's one piece of physics. And this one actually is a little bit different. It's, uh, this is the star Omicron City, or Myra as we know it, and uh, these are well, let's call them flares, but they're not. Uh, the star just explodes from time to time. And actually, it explodes quite regularly. So it, uh, it sends a lot of mass through space. Uh, think about a comet. It's a star that looks like a comet with a very, very large tail. So we know every one of these details, observing only these things, which you call light curves, as you know. But Let's focus a little bit on one of the cases. This case actually is similar to, sorry, is similar to this. We have two objects that eclipse each other. And you see, if I, if I put the proper slide, of course, and you see this is a kind of eclipse, a kind of eclipse we haven't seen on Earth. This is a picture of a Venus transit. This is the sun, and this black dot here, uh, this black dot is not part of the picture, uh, this black dot here is Venus passing in front of the sun. And you see part of, part of the sun is eclipsed, and therefore the apparent brightness drops a little. 
here's a picture of the entire thing. And if we measure very, very, very carefu carefully, we can see that we can, uh, we can plot this curve, and we can see a lot of things. There are a lot of details here. So for example, you might have a little bit of a, of a peak here. That's important. How, how steep that curve is, how rounded the bottom is, and things like that. I'm not going into more detail, but the greater picture here is this. You have the object, um, you know, the little object, the planet in front of it is not eclipsing it. So the object shines at its full brightness. You see, it's very bright. When the object approaches, the apparent brightness drops. When, when the object leaves, the apparent, the apparent brightness increases again. So that's the so-called transit. And it's actually a method for finding exoplanets. So actually, not only finding, we can, we can deduce a lot of things. And uh, we can even go into greater lengths. We can even think about what the atmosphere, if there is any, of this planet looks like. So only by looking at this curve, and probably some spectroscopic data, but that's not a thing, we can, we can see, we can think about what elements, what chemical elements, this planet might have in its atmosphere. Which is a great feat, if you ask me. But still, let's talk about identification. And this is the so-called transit method. We can deduce a lot of things, but what we're interested in is just finding exoplanets, or candidate exoplanets. Well, you see, the picture is very nice, but here is one very famous one. This is the TRAPPIST, TRAPPIST-1 system, which has a lot of things going on. And while the curve took very, very good previously, this is a real thing. And actually, when I talk about images, this is what we see. So we have to take this kind of image, we have to produce this thing here, and we have to somehow interpret it. And by interpreting it, we've obtained this, which is a model of what each planet might look like. You see, that's, uh, that's not a very easy thing to do. So you look at this, and you produce this. So you know you have uh, the radius, the period of uh, orbiting, the radius of orbiting, the so-called uh, major axis, major semi-axis actually, and you see you know almost everything about the planets, about their own properties like masses, radii, and so on, even atmosphere, if there is any. Uh, and also their kinematic or movement properties, how far they are from the star, how quickly they are orbiting the star, and so on. But still, can we identify more? Well, the first reason I'm presenting this talk is to talk about how machine learning can be used in a very, in a very complex, very different environment, and still produce good results without even understanding the whole problem, which is a very nice thing. The second reason, our best exoplanet hunter so far, the, the observatory Kepler, just closed their mission yesterday night. So we have to say farewell to Kepler, and uh, it just passed the torch to another observatory called K2, you know, from K2. So Kepler looked at a very small region in the sky, a carefully chosen one, though. And he tried to take a lot of pictures. By taking a lot of pictures over great many days, it could find a little bit more than we expected a number of exoplanets. Actually, we have a Bulgarian connection here. Uh, if you know Dimitri Sosov, who works in Harvard right now, he's one of the greatest guys in the Kepler mission and in searching for exoplanets in the entire world. And you know, in 1999 or in 2000, Dmitry thought, okay, we're going to start this mission and we're probably going to find, you know, a great many planets, probably about 1 or 200. Right now, we have almost 4,000. And that's, uh, that's a little bit unexpected, actually. And uh, keep in mind, this is a very small region in the sky. 
you might you might recognize these uh, these stars as signals the swan. It's a very beautiful summer constellation. So Kepler looks at this region. It finds a lot of objects which change their brightness over time. And our task is can we classify whether an whether a light curve is produced by a planet, because there are other reasons, as you already saw. You might see a light curve, which comes from an eclipsing binary, and it looks terribly similar to an exoplanet curve. So, how do we do that? You already saw the neural networks, I did. There are two classical approaches. The first is the really classical one, the so-called fully connected neural network. A fully connected neural network is for propagating directed acyclic graph of nodes which compute arbitrary functions. You take the input and you produce some output from it, passing through some hidden layers. Each layer is an ensemble of a few, n of a few neurons which work independently from each other, but each layer is dependent on the previous one and is fully connected to the previous one, also the next one. So this is the structure here, and uh, I'm not going into more details, but uh, it, can, it can compute arbitrary functions. Well, working with images, we prefer a little bit different architecture. The end of that architecture is the same as this, some fully connected layers. But the previous layers of this architecture are the so-called convolutional layers. Convolution is an operation for combining an image with a special kind of a function, which you call a kernel. And actually, in CNNs, convolutional neural networks, we teach the algorithm the values for that special kernel, which is usually a very small matrix. OK, so how is that useful? Well, working with images, you have the concept of locality. So for example, if I'm looking, not this one, sorry, if I'm looking at this image here, at, at this region, you see Kepler. But in this region, you also see Kepler. So in a very small region, the image doesn't change. So we might just uh, make some use of that. Also, the image is regular. There are objects, and convolutions are one of the best object detectors. So you see, we can just try these ones. And actually, when I'm presenting the paper, they've uh, match the performance to a very simple model, a linear regression model. Uh, well, you might think, how do you compare a linear regression with uh, a neural network? Well, you just do for performance sake. You just want to have a baseline performance. So I'm going to present a paper used, uh, sorry, created by Google Brain a little bit more than a month ago. So you see, this is a very, very modern research. So. Here's what they did. They took some white curves, and you see there are different types of white curves. For each white curve, they took two views. One uh, which is from, like, uh, for, a, uh, for a bigger period of time, the so-called global view, and one which is up close, the local view. And you see there are things which can be seen in the local view but not in the global view. So this, for example, is an exoplanet, which has a, uh, which has a shorter period. And it's well seen here, around the minimum. And you can see the minimum here, too. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's very pronounced. But here, the exoplanet has a very long period. And this means that we have very few data, data points here. We see the minimum here. But there is almost no evidence of it here. It's this point only. So, and uh, vice versa. This thing here looks similar. If you look at the local view, the local view for the first picture, which, which is an exoplanet, and the local view for this picture, which is not an exoplanet, it's an eclipsing binary as our goal, look the same. But if you take the global view, you see a greater picture. Which is, uh, which is something that we don't need. Well, this is why we, we need uh, two views for better accuracy. You see the close-up view, 
and the firewall V, the global V. So they took a lot of data, they made very basic image processing on that. I'm not going into more details because, you know, image processing is a little bit more specific to that problem. And also, image processing in astronomy is a quite, a quite specific thing. I can't, uh, I can't go into too much detail. But they saw some images taken from the Kepler Observatory, and they produced these data. For each, uh, for each of the observations, they knew exactly when and where this uh, minimum is. So this is the input data, and the label is the location of that minimum. What you need to predict is whether this location, this minimum, corresponds to an exoplanet, to an exoplanet or not, which is a simple case of binary classification. Okay, so they took two approaches, one with convolutional neural networks and one with a classical neural network. And you see, if you have two types of input, you better start by processing them separately. So here's the interesting point about architecture. They trained a twin network, actually a pair of twins. One one part of the network trains on the global view, one part trains on the local view. And after passing through some layers, they merge, and finally they predict whether that, whether that pair of pictures corresponds to um, an exoplanet or not, which is also something taken from YOLO, which is uh, object detection, phase detection, and so on. So they try to detect both things. This is the same kind of architecture, just implemented not with fully connected layers, but with convolutional layers. These things here, with the, the arrows, are convolutional layers, which finally feed into two, um, into two fully connected layers. So this is it. Adam optimizer, which is a very standard one, minimizing cross-entropy. You see, this is uh, neural networks 101. Uh, I just uh, had a lecture yesterday on, on neural networks, and I just presented something like that. So one student who has taken one lecture in a machine learning course knows how to implement this. OK, so here's the architecture that finally worked. A little bit more deep network connected to the global view, and the shallower network connected to a local view. Uh, this here is the convolutional part of it. And finally, you have, uh, in this case, four fully connected layers. Since uh, a neural network is something which is very different uh, to standard machine learning algorithms and can be very difficult to optimize, they tried various architectures. You see, this is Google Brain. They have a lot of CPU power. Actually, yeah, this is trained on a CPU, not on a GPU, which is very strange, but they did. Uh, they tried a lot of architectures, they tried a lot of things. This is the architecture that worked best. And you might see linear regression, fully connected layer, convolutional. Uh, sorry, fully connected neural network and convolutional neural network. The accuracy on the test set was 96%. And also the area under the curve, I'm going, uh, I'm talking about the area under the rock curve here, is 98.8. These are the best results. And actually, these are the best results that we get so far on any algorithm. Similar algorithms trained on the same data produce worse results. So this is state of the art. All right, but uh, you know, even the best machine learning algorithm is nothing if it can't predict things. So they tried to predict something. And they, they actually found out uh, a lot of things. First, they proposed some candidates. Candidates are things that look like exoplanets, but still need a little bit more observation to confirm whether they really are exoplanets or not. And you see, this is a very recent paper, so those candidates haven't been confirmed or rejected. But also, they found this thing here, Kepler 90i, which is the eighth exo, which is the eighth exoplanet in that system. Well, if you come to from A to I, it's the ninth letter. A actually is the star. One more real thing in astronomy, you know, every convention in astronomy is, is kind of weird. So 
please have a look at this. Relative brightness is the same thing as brightness just uh, taken as one where the, the flat part is. See how small that difference is. See how accurate um, a data taking, a data processing algorithm has to be. See how accurate uh, a machine learning algorithm has to be to produce these results, which have been confirmed. So this is something which is really good. The algorithm cannot only perform well on a testing set. It, not only, it does not only generalize well. It's able to predict things that we haven't been able to see up to now. And it's able to do miracles for us. Because uh, you see, I started with that. We have only light. We can't, we can't go there. The system is too far away. We can't do anything else but look at this picture and try to infer something from it. And it's very difficult to do so in this case. So here's what they did. And here's what we uh, usually use as state of the art now for exoplanet hunting. And uh, actually, there are a lot of things here, a lot of details. I have to say that uh, one of the greater successes in popular astronomy, as I might say, is one kind of competition, which uh, presented data like this, and Kagos had to find the 99 exoplanets within that, uh, within that data. They found the 100th one, which was later confirmed, which means that what we call citizen scientists, or backyard astronomers, people like you, tried to try to do their best on the data and all the algorithms, and they actually confirmed and they actually produced results that scientists weren't able to produce. One of the best things about science is that it's open to everyone. And so one of the best things about knowledge is that it can be shared. Uh, science stopped being arbitrary like some 600 years ago. It's not only for the chosen ones, it's for everyone. And everyone cannot only learn. Everyone can contribute to science. Even if it is by throwing your that was not a problem. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful talk, which not only roamed through uh, uh, astrophysics, it uh, uh, roamed through data science and uh, finished with, a, you know, with a lesson to all of us. Uh, we have several questions, and we are going to do more or less the same thing, which means that I'm going to sit over there and read the questions, because you're going to stay here in front of the audience and uh, uh, answer. Oh, Ara, can you read, it, read them from here? Well, the point is that we only have one microphone, so, uh, yeah. All right, can, we can switch. Then, um, first of all, there was one question that was left over from the previous, um, we had to cut, uh, cut down the, the questions. We will see how we are going to answer this question, probably in our data chat, but we will, we will talk about this later. But um, let's go here one by one. Do you think we will found planet we will find, obviously, Planet 9 or not. I hope you know. Well, we found Planet 9 in the, in the 1930s, I think. We call it Pluto. And actually, we demoted it after that. So we only have Planet 9. Yeah. Um, how about a new Planet 9? Well, actually, we have found hundreds of planets. Have you heard about Ceres, Isis? Haumea. These are what we call minor bodies in our solar system. And Pluto is uh, one of them. Pluto and uh, Chiron. So yeah, we have found not only planet 9, but planet 10 to planet several hundred. I lost count. All right. They are beyond the limit of whatever was called, but you, uh, you know better probably. Uh, how do you estimate the planet mass using the transit method with light curve? Obviously, this is a question towards you. Well, it's quite simple actually, but uh, I have to write equations. <laughs> um, okay, this is kinematics. This is a very... A bit further, okay. I think I may. 
So, it's simple kinematics. The equations of motion, the Newtonian equations of, mo of motion that you learned at school. You see, one object is orbiting the other. The force between them, the, gravity f the gravitational force between them, is proportional to their masses. But there is also another thing. Depending on how, how much they weigh and how far they orbit, their periods will be different. And, um, well, it's, uh, it's a well-known thing in physics, uh, the so-called uh, angular momentum conservation law. Uh, if you spin, you have to spin with a, with, a specific, um, with a specific velocity on a specific radius, and you have your own mass. By the way, uh, a very good example of this is uh, when you spin in a chair and you pull your hands towards you. You will start spinning faster. Your mass hasn't increased, but your radius has decreased, so your angular momentum increases. So, think about this very simple notion of angular momentum, which depends on mass, radius, and uh, velocity, I mean orbital velocity. We can deduce uh, how, far, uh, how much further away from the star planet is, or how much further an eclipsing binary is. So that's how. When you see the light curve, depending on how fast it drops, also depending on how, how long the minimum is, because it can be very short, it can be also very long, like, uh, you know, like a ball. And depending on the shape of the curve, you can deduce how far away the planet is. When you know the, rad uh, when you know the orbital radius, you can calculate the mass easily. Uh, next question is related somehow, uh, somewhat. How do you distinguish between a planet orbiting around a star, an object passing in front of the star but not orbiting it? Uh, and obviously another question which is connected, what if the object passes regularly? Obviously the, the presumption is that you do it uh, many times. Well, uh, actually this is uh, the, most, uh, the most obvious and actually the worst case of false positives here. And uh, one of the biggest uh, advantages of the algorithm I described is that it's somehow, well, you know, neural networks, neural networks aren't interpretable, it somehow manages to distinguish between these two things. Well, empirically, you have to look for a not so big decrease in brightness. You see, if an object is very big, and it passes in front, of the in front of the star, it will decrease the brightness a lot. If the object is smaller, it will, it will increase the brightness just a little bit. Also, when you have a very long series of observations, you start to, um, you start to see patterns. And also, how do you distinguish between a star, a, a binary star, an eclipsing binary star, and a planet, a, a star with a planet system or a planet? Well, you measure the mass. There's a very, a very big gap between the masses of a planet and the star. It's, a, it's at least a hundred times, but it's usually several thousand to several hundred thousand times. So you try to measure the mass of the planet, of the orbiting body, and you you can see, you can, you can very easily describe the object this way. Okay. Next one, obviously somebody has been reading, uh, reading the news. How are, how are we going to replace the Kepler telescope? We just did. Uh, we did yesterday, actually. So, the new K2 telescope has uh, the same mode of operation, but uh, a, different, a different set of instruments, a different... Uh, a different kind of optics, actually, and what's more important, it's able to collect more data. So that's how we're going to replace it. We already did. Also, a fun fact, Kepler was originally um, meant to, um, to work about uh, three years. It served us nine years. So that's a very, a very good service. So we'd, we just replaced it. Better optics, better image processing algorithms, better communication to Earth, and uh, also a different set of instruments, which means that uh, we're able to take data which we haven't been able to take. Okay, uh, obviously last one, there is not, nothing on YouTube, but anyway, last one for now. Um, how will the exoplanet database increase with something and something being at work? 
So I hope you know these thing, this, uh, things. So. Well, I don't, unfortunately. Right. So I'm not able to Probably to answer. Some yeah. Uh, well, if, if somebody well sorry, I can't answer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, so one of these, the test one, has been around for like uh, two or three months now, and the other is going to be launched next year. Well, I can't, uh, I can't explain because uh, I have to know what instruments there are, what wavelengths they're looking at, what region they're looking at, you see the different... Uh, different densities of stars. Uh, so for example, if we're looking at the galactic plane, we see a lot of stars. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of these stars may have a planet system. But if we look at the halo, which is away from the galactic plane, we'll, we'll see a different thing. Kepler was looking at the galactic plane, so it had luck. Actually, there are a lot of stars. And really? it's supposed, yeah, really. <laughs> like uh, billions and uh, by the way that's a problem because we have a selection bias a very 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 big selection bias uh, we see only the brightest stars which are very few uh, but still uh, and also the brightest stars um, try attempt to live uh, very quickly and they don't have the time to form a planet system mm, that's very bad you see the most, the, the best established planet systems are found around very faint stars, which live very modestly, but, uh, well, they, they can form planets. And also, not only they can form planets, once the planets are formed, they won't burn them. Because, you see, bigger stars tend to explode, tend to do a lot of things. So, it, it depends. It depends on what, what, what wavelengths they're looking at if that's visible light. Uh, what, uh, what kind of instruments they have? By the way, there are other methods. This is the, the transit method I described is the most widely used one, but there are other methods. So for example, in February, we have, uh, in February of this year, we have confirmed the first exoplanet which, uh, which was found using gravitational lensing. So you see there was a galaxy behind the, behind the host star, and because of very obscure quantum, quantum relativistic effects, the light from the galaxy is bent, passing around the star. And uh, by observing a very, very tiny change in light, we are able to not only see the star there, but to find the planet, which is, uh, which is a, great, uh, a great deal in astronomy. And by the way, this was uh, right before I graduated my uh, master's. So I just presented that and people were, were like, wow, that's very, that's very interesting, that's amazing. So uh, it, it depends. Okay, one, one, one more here, if you're aware, how far is the furthest found exoplanet? The one I just described is in another galaxy. And it was the first one found outside the Milky Way. So outside our own galaxy. Okay, so it's very far. Uh. Well, actually, well, let's see. Uh, we measure, we measure um, distance in different scales. We measure distance in meters and kilometers. But uh, when we go to when we go to astronomical scales, we measure distances in a different kind of a different kind of scale, different kind of units. So I might say light years, but that's a lot of light years. But uh, actually, we measure the distance using something called redshift. So if I say the galaxy is about redshift 5, that probably won't mean anything to you. That's why I said it's, it's too far. So everybody here thought that you were an answering fuzzily. But anyway, anyway, uh, say in parsec, which is uh, how many redshift, how many parsecs is one redshift? Okay. It's uh, not Okay, it's not clear. So five redshift is the is uh, acceptable. Redshift about five. Redshift about five. Okay, this would be. That's what we call astronomical precision, actually. Okay. So you might say four billion years plus or minus six. 
I've seen this. All right. <laughs> well, this is this is it. Anyway, uh, there are no questions in YouTube. There are more. We are closing this question, but still, uh, since we have so many people here, are there any other questions coming from the hall? Here, yeah, Annie. So, is there a way for you to detect uh, like moons or um, other smaller objects uh, circular, um, around like around the planet or even not a planet? Okay. Here you are. Well, there are ways. They are related to this, but uh, you see, it's dif it's difficult to look at a faraway star. Let alone find the planet. Or around it. Speaking about moons, well, there are two methods that work. One of them is similar to the transit method, but uh, not very good. So you see if the planet and the moon simultaneously obs obscure parts of the star, the brightness will drop a little bit more. After a while, when the moon passes in front of the planet or behind the planet, it will increase in brightness slightly. But that's still unreliable. You see the we can't even see the star. So how about the planet? There's another way. Uh, we, can, we can look at the, the atmospheric composition, but that requires another type of observations. It requires spectrographic observations. So if we see a rock in the atmosphere of something, the atmosphere is gaseous, of course. So if you see a rock where you should see air, well, it's probably a moon. That, that's the gist of it. It's, it's quite more complicated than that. Again, this is, a, again, astronomical precision yeah. here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, are there any other questions from the, from the room here? Okay. In this case, I would like to thank uh, Jordan for his very interesting uh, talk, but also, but also for his um, answering his questions that, are, that were so different, so various. Now, uh, bear with me a few more minutes be before we give, give uh, our l lottery. Uh, we have to announce several things. First of all, this is our our pride, our website of Data Science Society. You who, and uh, right now we have currently what we have running is something that we call data. Um, sorry, monthly challenge. Uh, it is something like the data ton, but expand it into a whole month. So basically, there is a very interesting challenge, by the way, the, is the clear, how clear is the Sophie air, and can we predict it, and so on. Uh, but the point is here is that it's more of an educational direction. So every week we have cut down the, we have cut, cut down the um, uh, case into four different sub-cases, and every week we are putting some instructions about the next week's assignment, and then at the end of the week there is some feedback, and then we give the next part of the case, and so on. And we have, uh, right now we have 18 different teams solving the cases, the case, so it seems like it's going, uh, moving fine. So this is uh, a thing that you can join right away, right now. The other thing that we would like you to, sh to, to show is our next coming Datathon, which is really a high-tech thing, uh, is going to be in January. This is, um, okay, the long story short, can you show me my favorite logo here? I need to show, I need to see a, a logo. Just scroll a little bit, I need the partners. Yeah, 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 oh, we don't have the partners here, doesn't matter. Okay, the partners are, long story short, we are working with, uh, for the last year or so, we have been working with um, MIT, with the Qatar Institute, uh, uh, with ADATA Pro, and we are working on creating a really interesting case on natural language processing. We used to have this uh, case of uh, detecting fake news, it was like, year and a half ago, and we, we aced it. We did, uh, all of our teams were excellent there. Uh, but uh, anyhow, the, the, the thing that we have this time is f something f really further, further uh, apart from, uh, from fake news. It is propaganda detection. And we have uh, 
Yeah, hack the news data tunnel. Right. Oh, this is the, this is it. And um, and the propaganda detection, we have the we have a special methodology. Which methodology is really high tech? It's done by Preslav Nakov. This is no secret. And by the guys Giovanni and uh, Alberto. Of, their, their names are some, somewhere here. I, I, I apologize for. No, no, okay, they're here. And uh, this uh, and uh, this uh, these guys have actually created a full data set that is very rare. Uh, we have so uh, so much data that we actually created a three-level data ton, which means that if you wish, you can solve the. The simplest level, if you wish, you can solve the harder. If you wish, you can go to the hardest. So make sure to check it out. This is really, this is really going to be one of the, the events for the next several months in, in data science for sure. The other thing that I wanted to, to show, I'm not sure that whether you have logged in in the data chat, but in the data chat we have a, uh, our channel which is uh, devoted to meetups. Uh, so it is. Um, yeah, you're going to see our data chat no, nonetheless. Uh, and we are discussing the future topics of our uh, the future topics of our uh, uh, of our meetup. So you can join the conversation. You can propose. You can be actively part of this, this the, uh, conversation. So right now we have just sort of a spreadsheet here, but you can you can join the conversation to to discuss it there. Uh, have I missed anything? I'm asking the marketing department. Have I missed anything for that I need to show here? Or we can switch to, to, to the lottery. Okay, I'm going to ask, we have a, a random generator of all the names, uh, for the names that, uh, oh, just a second, Let's keep it here. So the lottery is about, again, about our tickets the, uh, about tickets that are pro provided by, by we're develop developers. Uh, that uh, about their AI Congress in Vienna, 4th and 5th of uh, December. We have one ticket here, and also we have, and we are going to put this in the Slido or somewhere else, we have a special promotion code, which is a community code especially given for Data Science Society, and this code uh, gives you a serious deduction of the price with about 100 euros. So can we have the code? Okay, it's here. All right, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the regular the the regular ticket is uh, I think is about the cheapest is I think is 300 euros, and we have a special discount if you if you use this code meetup dash one nine nine, which which is the price for this if you would like to join. Uh, so this is the this is the event and this is the discount. And now would you switch to the testing random? A, a random uh, generator. We're going to use this uh, application and we are just, uh, right now we are showing you how it works. We're going to click several times so that you know that it works uh, fine. And for the next, okay, yes. And for the, uh, on the other, and in the other window we have the, uh, uh, loaded, uh, again the same result, uh, the, the same application, you can click there. And we are going to click once. Actually, I'm going to. Would you would you click on? Oh, this is this is where it's going. To, oh, this is the correct one. Okay, I'm going to sh I'm going to ask somebody from the audience to click, and uh, and I need to be somebody who is looking like a destiny. And you, you know, the destiny is a lady and a blind lady. So I need <laughs> so I need a lady, and the closest to a blind lady would be somebody with glasses. A lady with glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I see over there our destiny for today. She's going to click just once. But without the glasses. Of course. <laughs> don't look at the screen, just click just click. Okay. She, so she's going to just click here and the winner for the AA Congress ticket is is going to jump off the name. And hopefully this guy is here or the lady is here. Okay, she's new at being destiny. Okay, click. Girl uh, Naidenova, is she here? Come over. Congratulations. Congratulations. 
you won our award, which is basically a free ticket to pass for the conference of uh, AI Congress, uh, uh, you know, by, pro provided by our partners from We Are Developers. Uh, we have a marketing people here who is going to explain how, what is this, but you're here for the picture, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> come, come closer. We, uh, would you paste the We Are Developers screen and, you know, marketing guys. <laughs> okay. So, so what's your name? Gergana. Okay, Gergana, thank you. And thank you, Annie, for being a destiny. At least one person here help, uh, thanks you a lot. And uh, have we forgotten something? No? All right. In this, in, in this case, we can turn to the bill, which is al already gone. But this was it for today, tonight. And uh, thank you for uh, being part of this meetup. Come again, l register online, and happy Halloween, everyone.